Well, good morning, and thank you all for um, joining Insurance Europe this morning to our webinar so numerously. Uh, the webinar is on Solvency 2 and how to get it right and support EU recovery. We have uh, 550 people registered, so very happy about the huge interest in this topic. As you all know, Solvency 2 is uh, the prudential framework that underpins the European insurance industry. And this framework is strongly supported by our industry. It has clearly proved its value since it was first applied in 2016. Insurance Europe uh, certainly welcomes the current review of the framework. We believe that this is a timely opportunity for policymakers to enable Europe's insurers to achieve their full potential in three areas. First, supporting the EU objectives set out in the Green Deal and in the Capital Markets Union. Second, supporting post-pandemic economic recovery. And third, defending and maintaining our global competitiveness um, in, in um, you know, uh, generally the insurance sector worldwide. Just one of those areas would be enough, uh, certainly, to make the review of Solvency II a top priority. All three make it an absolute imperative that we get the review right. I will leave, obviously, the detail to the panel. Uh, debate. Um, we will hear from speakers from the European Parliament. Very happy that the coordinator of the ECOM committee, MEP Markus Ferber, is with us this morning. Also, um, the French Ministry of Finance, the Tresor, and of course, also representatives of the insurance industry. Um, to close our event today, there will be some comments from Irene Tignali, the chair of the European Parliament's ECON Committee. And of course, we also have in the panel um, the Commission uh, joining us with their perspective. But first, it is my great pleasure to introduce some open remarks from Sean Berrigan, the Director General of the European Commission's DG FISMA, to start with. Thank you very much and have a nice webinar. Good morning, everybody. And first of all, I'd like to thank Insurance Europe for organizing this online event and for inviting me to provide some opening remarks. Today's webinar deals with the review of Solvency II, and this review is, of course, high on the Commission's financial services agenda for 2021. Back in 2016, the Solvency II Directive brought major changes to prudential supervision of the insurance sector in the EU. Under its first pillar, an entirely new risk-based framework for the regulation of insurance activities was developed. And this was complemented by qualitative and transparency requirements under pillars two and three. In sum, I suppose we could say the reform aligned potential supervision more closely with state-of-the-art risk management practices. And now, after five years of application, I think there is broad agreement that Solvency II has been working well. And the COVID crisis has been a real-life test of that. Without drawing conclusions too early, I think we are all largely reassured about Solvency II's robustness and the industry's ability to fare well through difficult times. So with that in mind, one could ask whether this means we should just leave the rules as they are. In response to that, I would recall that the introduction of Solvency II was indeed a major and fundamental reform. And the positive experience with that reform suggests that we should not touch the fundamental principles of Solvency II. These include valuation on the basis of market prices and risk-based capital requirements. But on the other hand, we can't afford to be complacent either. We need to ensure that Solvency II remains fit for purpose and adequately tackles the challenges of our times, and more specifically, the low for long situation. Thanks to IOPA's hard work, we now have technical advice that proposes a number of improvements to be considered in the review of Solvency II. And since that advice was published last December, we've been discussing its contents internally in the Commission. And although we're not yet in a position to draw firm conclusions, 
I want to go through some aspects that are under consideration. I'd like to start with the Union's political priorities. As you know, the EU has set ambitious targets for economic recovery and the green transition. Large-scale private investment will be needed to achieve those targets. And EU insurers can play a key role here, given that they collect more than 1 trillion euros in premiums each year, and those premia need to be invested. With respect to economic recovery, access to equity financing for businesses is a priority area. This is needed to counterbalance the accumulation of debt amid the economic lockdowns to address the ongoing pandemic. Equity investment is an area I think where insurers have probably been punching below their weight. And for that reason, we stated in the recent CMU action plan that we'll look into the treatment of equity investment under Solvency II. As regards the green transition, we need to make sure that climate and environmental risks are better taken into account by insurers. So we'll assess the case for relevant clarifications in Solvency II, notably as regards risk management. It's also important to assess whether capital requirements for sustainable investments are a potential obstacle to the green transition. I understand that large parts of the insurance industry are concerned that green supporting factors could undermine Solvency II's risk-based nature. We hear that concern, but I believe we have a duty to continue constructive dialogue about evidence on the riskiness of sustainable investments. This question will be relevant not only during the preparations for the upcoming Solvency II review, but it's also going to be relevant for many years to come. Let me now turn to risk sensitivity and market-based valuation. As I mentioned earlier, these principles are essential to Solvency II's success. On the one hand, we have to acknowledge that the Solvency II framework doesn't capture the effects of durably low and even negative interest rates. So it is legitimate to ask whether rules on capital requirements or rules on the valuation of, lia or of liabilities or both need to be updated. On the other hand, we are aware also of concerns related to volatility caused by the use of market valuation. Excessive short-term volatility in prudential requirements could cause frictions with long-term investments and the provision of long-term insurance products. Short-term volatility is addressed by the long-term guarantee measure, in particular the volatility adjustment. However, some argue that this measure is not so well calibrated, overcompensating in some circumstances and undercompensating in others. IOPA has proposed a series of changes to address this issue, and we are assessing whether these changes strike a good balance between risk sensitivity and the aim of avoiding excessive volatility. A third priority area is the proportionality of Solvency II rules. Now, Solvency II already requires proportionate implementation as a general principle. However, from our re outreach activities, we concluded that the general principle does not work as well as it should. I hope it shares that view and is proposing a new approach with the introduction of a new category of low-risk profile insurers. Such an approach could help to provide more clarity on when and how insurers should benefit from a lower regulatory burden. Another element in this regard is the scope of solvency too. Small insurers below defined thresholds are already exempted from the solvency directive. We are now exploring the possibility of increasing those thresholds, and this, of course, would allow more insurers to benefit from the exemption. I also want to say a few words on policyholder protection, which is, as you know, is the key objective of the framework. Solvency II has certainly improved the level playing field and supervisory convergence. And we all know that well-supervised cross-border business benefits policyholders, be they individuals or businesses. However, there have been several cases of cross-border failures in the past years, which have shed some light on existing weak spots in the protection of policyholders. We need to look at these cases and consider whether existing rules need to be upgraded, including in relation to the supervision of cross-border business and insurance groups. Furthermore, the experience also leads us to think that we probably need to set up a range of instruments for the detection 
preparation and management of insurers in financial distress. So based on IOPA's opinion, we are exploring the introduction of recovery and resolution elements in the Solvency II framework. In addition to this, the minimum harmonization of national insurance guarantee schemes could foster the protection of policyholders, both in case of liquidation and resolution across the EU. A proportionate approach in this regard, I believe could strengthen the trust in the single market for insurance, while of course, respecting national choices. And then a final word on financial stability issues. I think we can all agree that insurance companies are different from banks and are not exposed to the same kind of systemic risks. Nevertheless, in these times, we have a responsibility to make sure that our regulatory framework is fit for purpose in all its aspects. IOPA and the ESRB have recommended improvements in this respect in the form of an enhanced macroprudential toolkit. We're looking at these as well, mindful of the need to avoid imposing requirements that would not be justified or would hinder the industry's ability to play its role in the economic recovery. So let me conclude my remarks by simply recalling that Solvency II has been a success and we want to continue this success story. That's why we need to get the review right, as the title of this webinar suggests. In my view, getting it right will mean finding the right balance. Balance between the need to introduce improvements when required and the need to recognize that insurance companies are already overall well capitalized. The Commission will draw its conclusions over the next few months. That means we are still listening to proposals brought forward by stakeholders. And so this webinar is taking place still at a good moment. And with that in mind, I wish you all a very fruitful discussion in the remainder of the webinar. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hello, um, Hello. and thank you yeah. to John Berrigan for providing opening views from the Commission. This sets a very good background to our panel discussion. My name is Olaf Jones, Deputy Director General at Insurance Europe. I'll be moderating the panel and I'll be inviting the audience to submit questions during the debate because at the end we have a Q&A uh, session and it'll be very interesting to hear the, the audience questions. We have an excellent panel today and I'm very happy to introduce, first of all, Lionel Corr, Director of the Insurance Division at the French Treasury, Marcus Faber, MEP, Allegra Van Hervel Patrizzi, Group Chief Risk Officer to Aegon, Albon de May Nel, Group Chief Risk uh, in Investment Officer uh, at AXA Group, and Didier Milliro, Head of Insurance Unit, DG FISMA at the European Commission. Now, we're at a very key stage in the, uh, in the review. The Commission has EOPA's opinion and is in the process of developing its legislative proposals. Now, a significant part of those proposals will be focusing on the issue of long-term business and long-term investment and how the review can uh, support the, the industry's uh, role in the key objectives of recovery um, and uh, the uh, CMU and sustainable investment. So we'll start with uh, questions on that. So starting with Albon, could you give an overview of the improvements the industry has identified as key for the review so that it addresses the concerns about how solvency to treats and impacts long-term business and investment. Thank you, Olaf, and um, good morning, all. Um, so I, I think the first thing to say, which is also something that um, John Berrigan noted in his um, introductory um, speech, is that the Solvency II framework is working overall. And the recent crisis proved it, and it was a financial and an insurance crisis but nevertheless, we saw the robustness of the Solvency II framework. So there's uh, no need to change it fundamentally. I think there are a number of flaws that uh, need to be corrected. And those flaws concern notably the long-term investments and the long-term products. Uh, for those, I believe that capital requirements are too high. And there is probably also too much volatility in uh, the Solvency II framework, which as such increases also the need 
for for capital in um, in insurance companies and mutuals. Uh, so that um, necessary additional capital requirement increases the cost of long-term protection products for our uh, customers, and therefore is also detrimental to our ability to um, invest in long-term uh, investments, long-term assets. But what we need is a number of selected, focused improvements, and not a revolution. A uh, number of improvements that will achieve those defined objectives on uh, two aspects. One is um, the European rec recovery and the green transition. And as was said earlier, uh, public money will not be sufficient to fund that recovery and to fund that transition. And therefore, the, um, uh, in the asset owners that, um, that are the uh, insurers need to participate and we need to favor that participation by lowering those capital requirements. The second aspect is the fact that because we have an aging population in Europe, we need to be able to provide long-term protection products to our customers. And those two aspects, long-term assets, participation in the European recovery, green transition on one hand, and protection for our policyholders, are obviously interlinked. We can only invest in long-term assets, in infrastructure, in green energy, with a long-term focus, if we have on the, on the policy side, also long-term policies, long-term protection, and therefore visibility on both our assets and liabilities. So for me, it's key that uh, the Solvency II revision addresses those items so that we reduce the, the capital requirements for long-term assets, long-term products. Obviously, in um, AOPA's advice, there are uh, a few good proposals, and, uh, and I will uh, mention a few. Um, the first one is that I think we, we all need to recognize that uh, negative interest rates are reality, and we need to embed that reality in the Solvency II framework, and the, in particular in the calculation of the uh, SCR, the required capital. That, that's obvious, that's to that reality, and that was also um, mentioned by John Derrigan. Another key aspect is the reduction of the risk margin proposed by the EOPA. That's a significant amount of capital that is trapped in the form of the risk margin and that we need to release, again, in order to favor long-term investments and long-term products. The EOPA's advice goes in the right direction, but I think we could go much further than this in reducing the, um, the risk margin. The third aspect is on the volatility adjuster. But I want to be specific on this. I think the EOPA proposal is good as far as the country VA is concerned, because we've seen that in some areas, in some countries today, it was not efficient enough to reduce volatility. But I believe in some other aspects of the volatility adjuster, we, we don't need to change fundamentally the mechanism because it has worked well so far. And finally, the, the, um, the fourth aspect of the uh, AOPA proposal that I want to highlight as uh, something that goes in the right direction is for those who use the standard formula, the, uh, the criteria to, um, uh, for long-term equity has been improved. And we need to look at that but we, we probably need, again, to go further than the, um, the proposal made by the EOPA, because that's something that overall needs to be favored if we want to participate in the uh, recovery, if we want to help our industry, help our uh, SMEs, we need to be able to invest in equity, and therefore we need to uh, revise the, uh, the calibration. But fundamentally, I want to, uh, to come back to some proposals that do not go in the right direction, i.e. that do not support the, um, 
the fact that the insurance industry needs to participate in the recovery and long-term investments. The current um, opinion of the EUPA goes in the direction overall of more conservativeness. That is not needed. Solvency II is already a very conservative framework, probably the most conservative uh, globally of all of all frameworks. Uh, so we don't need to strengthen it. And as I said at the beginning, given that the crisis has proven that insurers resisted well, there is no need to add another layer of capital or to add conservativeness. And I believe, as I said, that we don't need a revolution. We need to change things very precisely in order to achieve uh, the European Commission's uh, objective so let's make sure that we do not change features of the Solvency II framework that today work well and for which there is no empirical evidence that they should be improved. And I'm thinking, for instance, of the uh, WTVT adjuster. So for me, that should be the framework in which we should have the, uh, the discussion on the revision of, um, of Solvency II. Before passing over to to the other, other panelists, I would like to, like to keep with the industry and hear from uh, Allegra. The um, uh, the industries maybe some more detail on the industry's views on on EOPA's proposals. Yes, of course. Thank you, Olaf. Um, look, I agree with the key objectives and issues raised by Albon, and maybe indeed I can add some detail on some of the changes that are needed, and then also some of the changes that are needed to EOPA's advice. So let me start first, I think, with the major issue we face, which is the issue of volatility. And actually, the issue we're facing is one of artificial volatility, and therefore an art a volatility that really doesn't serve, serve any purpose. So there's a number of reasons, uh, a number of items we would like to change there. First of all, markets and asset prices, of course, are volatile. We know that. But it's important to, 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 to note that as insurers, we can manage it. With a combination of assets and liabilities, we look at cash flows as well as values, and we can match a lot of interest rate risk and spread risk over time. And we do have a great deal of flexibility over whether we sell an asset, which asset to sell, and when to sell it. This is thanks to the uh, illiquidity of our liabilities. So we can avoid being in a forced selling situation and so the net real volatility of a balance sheet is low, and that needs to be recognized somehow in the system. So this is a core advantage of our business model, which creates benefits for customers. It allows us to be long-term investors in the economy and therefore support important objectives of the economy, like green objectives and other. And it's also important for our shareholders. So it is vital that uh, Solvency II fully recognizes this economic reality and the benefit it creates for all, including society. So this is why we have the long-term guarantee package, the famous LTG in Solvency II, to try to reflect precisely this aspect of our business model. So the volatility adjustment is a key part of that. And without, and without it, Solvency II would have not have worked at all. Of course, the VA, uh, for, for friends, i.e. the volatility adjustment, needs improving because it is calibrated too low and it is not good enough at mitigating this volatility today. And it does not reflect today the reality of the asset allocation in certain countries. So we have seen some of that in the last few years with the spread movements and the COVID-19 crisis. But actually that market volatility, which we saw recently, is actually small compared to what we saw a decade or so ago. So the VA in the future might be even more stressed than it has been recently. So Albo already highlighted that some of the OPA's proposals for improving uh, the VA can be a good basis for improvement. And so we should build on that. But EOPA also proposes changing the risk correction. And this would frankly undermine the other good ideas that make the, and make the VA way less effective during market turbulence. The analysis shows that the current risk correction is already conservative. And EOPA also proposes to introduce a liquidity ratio, while liquidity is something best covered under Pillar 2 or even Pillar 3. 
So these two elements of EOPA's proposals would make the VA less effective as opposed to more effective and introduce yet unnecessary complexity. On top of that, it is imperative to allow regulators, in our view, to exercise their good judgment and use dynamic VA type of mechanism to mitigate this unwanted artificial volatility. The third big point I would make is that the interest rate ex extrapolation is one area where we really, really disagree with you. Uh, first of all, because the current methodology already allows for low and negative rates, and with the UFR getting lower each year, low interest rate capital charges and stress testing, there is enough to ensure reserving is high enough and customers are protected. There is no need for more. So introducing more conservativeness in the framework with the new extrapolation proposed by EOPA can only damage insurers' capacity to offer long-term products by increasing liabilities and introducing yet more volatility. And therefore, this is a hidden tax on customers and is actually a hidden hindrance for them to find societal solutions in the future. On uh, the fourth point, which was the risk margin, Neopra have made a start by recognizing one of the three strong justifications for lowering the risk margin, and we welcome that. So, but it is only a start because today at 160 billion, uh, the, the risk margin is far too high and other changes are needed to arrive at an appropriate level. To give some examples, um, you know, we would consider to reduce, frankly, the cost of capital because 6% is too high. The world looks a lot different now than it did a decade ago, and the lower calibration is justified. And on the last point, which is the solvency capital requirement for assets, well, NIOPA proposals uh, recognize that the long-term equity criteria doesn't currently work, and with some changes, it, this could help. So that's good. On spread risk, we see a need to extend the dynamic volatility adjustment to the standard formula. EOPA did not propose this, but unfortunately, they did propose adding new requirements to the DVA for internal model users. And as we said earlier, that's not a good idea. We should let the regulators use their judgment in making sure that the DVA can be used in order to uh, eliminate and mitigate some of this artificial volatility that exists. So the proposal that is on the table on this topic now will add complexity and limitations for internal models which are already so carefully scrutinized by supervisors that I think yet more uh, conservativeness and yet more limitations are not needed. We need to trust the judgment of the national regulators. Thank you, Allegra. So I think the message from the industry is, is clear that uh, EOPA has some good ideas, but some significant uh, changes are, are needed uh, and elements, certain elements are missing. Um, maybe at this point I could pass over to Didier. Uh, what, are, what are the EC's overarching objectives when it comes to looking at issues around measuring long-term uh, business, long-term investments? Do you have any comments on the industry suggestions at this stage? Thank you, Olaf. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope that I can make myself uh, audible to everyone. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, let me start by saying, like, like Sean did uh, a few minutes ago, that these are still early days for a commission. Now we are working hard on our on our solvency to package, which will be made of uh, legislative proposals and an impact assessment to be presented sometime in in, the, in July. So, uh, the big political decisions um, have not been taken yet. So, what I'm going to tell you today, of course, needs to be uh, taken with that. Uh, uh, a certain level of, uh, of, of caution. This being said, um, we, of course, are going to look at the issues which uh, uh, previous speakers have mentioned. It's going to be uh, central to the uh, to the review. Uh, the ability of Solvency II to tackle the risks to which um, insurers are confronted, and also the ability of Solvency II to deal with um, excessive short-term volatility. These are essential uh, points for the, let's say, the solidity, the robustness of the framework, and we need to, to get it right. And the, the Solvency II review is an opportunity to look at those points. Uh, we know now that we are going to live in a low interest rate environment for some time, so we need to make sure that this is uh, 
appropriately uh, tackled by the sovereignty to framework. So we are looking at what IOPA has proposed on these two issues. Um, improvements are, are there. There's been a lot of technical work and there's also a consensus among the supervisory community that uh, those solutions, uh, I would say, need uh, have, would, would merit to be to be further examined and taken into account by, by the Commission. So we are, we are looking at that. Um, this being said, uh, that discussion should be should not sorry should not be uh, held in isolation. Uh, we need to ensure the robustness uh, of the framework. On the other hand, but also in parallel, as uh, said by Sean, but also underlined already by previous speakers, we need to make sure that this is not done to the detriment of the ability of the insurance industry uh, to play its role in the economy. Uh, to help with the recovery and to help with the decarbonization of our society. So we need to find a balance there. Um, IOPA itself was already, I think, uh, conscious of that, has made some uh, proposals to kind of rebalance the effect of the changes it suggests to the uh, um, uh, interest risk, rate risk module, the extrapolation system, but also the volatility adjustment to try and find ways to uh, compensate for the increase uh, that would be the consequences of uh, introducing those new uh, mechanisms in terms of additional capital requirements and uh, higher technical provisions. So we, we think that this is the right approach, huh? trying to, to balance um, these things, uh, trying to make the, the framework as risk sensitive as possible, but on the other hand, being, being mindful of the need to uh, to um, allow the insurers to, to play their role and as was also underlined by um, several speakers to uh, uh, continue to be able to offer long-term product and high quality products to their customers. Uh, the question for us will be to see whether what IOPA has proposed is enough. Um, we, we hear quite a lot that um, more could be done in this respect. Um, we are going to examine those possibilities. I mean, these are, uh, will, let's say, be part of the options which we are going to contemplate as part of our impact assessment. Um, things can be done in terms of um, smoothening in time, uh, ensuring more transition towards the move to the new, uh, the new system. Um, a lot is also being said about, the, let's say, the um, uh, the risk margin and the fact that it uh, represents today um, too big a, a burden on the industry, so more could be done uh, according to those voices to reduce the size of that risk margin. This is something which we're going to, to examine as well. Um, but also, uh, as was also mentioned by, uh, I think, uh, Allegra and Alban, we also need to, to see whether the framework contains the right incentives to uh, allow insurers to, um, uh, in particular, invest in, in, in long-term equity. And uh, we are grateful there as well for IOPA's suggestions to, to review the criteria that should lead insurers to, to buy more of these assets and therefore contribute more to the uh, recovery uh, and the re-equitization of, uh, of our economy. And as you know, this is a, a, an important uh, element um, that uh, was mentioned in our communications on the capital market union. So overall, this is what the Commission is looking at, the right balance, not an easy call. Um, some key decisions will need to be uh, taken there, but we, uh, we're trying to uh, approach that discussion uh, with, uh, let's say, a, a broad set of options, and uh, let's see what uh, will be the, uh, the final political decision at the end. I'll stop here. Thank you, Olaf. Thank you very much. Um, just remind people, uh, the audience to please do enter your, your questions um, uh, so that we can uh, cover them at the end. There is maybe one question, if, if you don't mind, uh, Didier, that uh, we've been posed that I would just ask now, and that's a question over <clears throat> when will the, uh, in terms of overall timing, um, you know, given the, the need for, for this to have, uh, to, to impact the insurer's ability to help with recovery, et cetera, uh, when will the, these changes uh, come into force for insurers? Uh, 
Um, on this, I shall uh, speak under the control of Marcus Ferber, who is, at the end of the day will be the, the master of the decision in this respect. But we will present our proposals in, um, in the summer, in July, most probably. And that will consist of um, level one changes, so changes to the sovereignty to directive, but also at some point we'll need to look at the uh, at the level two. So usually these discussions take, um, let's say, uh, 18 months, two years, and then you need to to provide some time for member states to um, to to implement the changes. Uh, of course, things can enter into force at different stages, but. I would say that the review will not be uh, fully uh, complete uh, before uh, member states have had the time to to turn the uh, new provisions of the directive into the national law. So if we make the proposal this year, I mean, you can say if you calculate two plus one or two years, we uh, realistically uh, are looking or contemplating an entry into application in, uh, let's say, 2020. 25. Oh, that's that's the reality of the European uh, process. Uh, uh, again, uh, things may enter into force before because there is a, there is level two. We we'll, we we'll need to see how how to combine this. This is one of the challenge of the review and to combine to combine the changes to level one and level two. Uh, mm -hmm. And in in many instances, uh, things are interconnected, so it's difficult to do one without the other. But um, uh, we will try to find the, the best way to, uh, to go ahead with that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, I will turn to Linel Ko. Um, as a representative of one of the largest economies in, in the EU, what is your, your view on how the review should be approached and with what aims for Europe's economies, especially regarding the aftermath uh, of the uh, COVID-19 crisis? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Olaf. Um, so um, I, I, I'm pretty much in line with uh, with the introduction that was made by uh, Michaela and John, and by what been said by the previous speakers. Um, as we think, the solvency to prove its value, like Michaela uh, Kohler said, and uh, we also have issues to solve. Uh, in order to fit the purpose, to tackle the issues of our time, as uh, John Berrigan said. And uh, indeed, we are going through uh, turbulent times, you're right. Uh, the economic consequences of the crisis are still not clear, but uh, they will not be good and they will be uh, massive. So this is why we are uh, developing currently recovery plans at European level, at national level. And the idea of these recovery plans is to uh, support our economies as long as necessary in order uh, not to leave the, uh, the breakdown that we managed to avoid at European level currently through the support. Uh, but the recovery is, uh, uh, is another phase which is very, 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 very important on which we, we need to, um, to support, to, to have the public support go as long as, as, uh, long as necessary, but at the same time economy to come back. And uh, the needs of financing are different uh, of what we are doing now. We're just bringing cash in order to have our companies survive. But the next phase is to allow the economy to come back and companies to invest. Uh, and for that, we, uh, we can support, we need to support as, uh, as public states at European level, but we need uh, the private sector uh, to be there to invest because uh, otherwise we won't be uh, able to uh, to have uh, enough support we won't be able to have economy to uh, uh, to come back at its rights and uh, this is why for instance we are developing in france currently a new quasi equity uh, scheme which was approved by the european commission uh, two weeks ago uh, in order to strengthen all the viable firms uh, with very long term financing almost equity uh, and to all of them to uh, continue or to resume investing and uh, there will be a, a public support in sort of guarantee but uh, the the investment will be done by uh, uh, the private sector and uh, slightly by the banks but mostly uh, we're expecting institution investors and especially insurance companies so this is our priority uh, our priority uh, is uh, to foster the fact that uh, all our savings, all our uh, private investors are contributing to uh, the recovery. Uh, 
And in fact, it means that uh, go even quicker on the implementation on the ground of the political objectives of the European Union that prevail even before the crisis, the as the CMU. Uh, and so the, this financing of the economy is at the very core of the recovery plan. So at the same time, we should not deter uh, insurance companies to invest in the economy, in equity, in uh, long-term uh, financing, like quasi-equity because uh, we, uh, we will not achieve our goals, definitely, uh, if we not, do not tackle this issue, which is really the priority currently of our policy at European level, at national level, currently. So uh, in this regard, uh, Solvency II review is definitely the, uh, the, uh, the turning point. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, this review comes at the right time. Uh, it's an opportunity not to be missed. Uh, which brings us to the idea that uh, it should be both ambitious, because things are working, and we should definitely not uh, uh, change the general mechanics of the model, which proved its value. Uh, we should not change what uh, what is globally working, and for instance, uh, uh, the long-term guarantee package uh, that was uh, quoted this morning is uh, uh, something that globally is working. It does mean that there cannot be some some uh, improvement, uh, but globally, for instance, the volatility adjuster is working. But on some other aspects, especially long-term equity and equity in general, and long-term financing, uh, the model as is biased as drawbacks, and this should be uh, tackled ambitiously. And uh, and also as swiftly as possible. I heard what uh, Didier said about the the uh, the, the schedule. Uh, we we really are determined to uh, do as uh, everything that we can in order to have it go quicker. Uh, it doesn't mean to be less ambitious uh, on this issue regarding this uh, uh, the importance. Uh, I would also like to uh, to stress the fact that uh, for us these political objectives. Uh, of utmost importance are interconnected with prudential objectives and they're not in contradiction with each other. Uh, and with the risk-based nature of Solvency II framework, which we, we do not uh, uh, challenge, which is uh, something which should is, which is be safeguarded. For instance, fostering long-term investments in the real economy uh, through equity, uh, for instance, on, on, on listed equity, this allows insurers to play their contracyclical role in our financial markets. So this contributes to financial stability as a whole, and this contributes to uh, prudence as a whole. This also contributes to sustainability. We don't need a green supporting factor uh, in, in order to uh, do this by allowing uh, insurance company to play their contracyclical and their long-term investor role, we contribute uh, to this issue. So uh, our minister recently wrote to uh, the European Commission on this subject matter to call for uh, real political guidance of this review. This review should not be a technical one. Uh, this definitely should be uh, driven by uh, our uh, goals of public policy. And then uh, the, of course, we will have to make the, the right technical choice according to these uh, to these goals. AFS advice is a key, an important piece of the review. There are lots of work that has been done by our supervisors, uh, but at the end of the day, this is not also the end of the story. This is a contribution, and this is also our role as member states, as treasuries, uh, as co-legislators, uh, with also the parliament, to, uh, to contribute uh, with the Commission today and then in the debate in order to, uh, uh, to push forward these political objectives uh, in the review. Thank you, Linnell. Uh, now, uh, over to Marcus Faber. As a long-standing member of the European Parliament and having taken part in previous discussions on the Solvency II framework, how do you see the Solvency II review in the current socio-economic context? I think you're on mute, Marcus. I think I think we have a um, slight technical problem. I'll, 
I'll wait uh, just a little while longer. Uh, hello, Marcus. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Oh, that's good news. So, uh, Olaf, sorry for that. I uh, did everything according <laughs> the description, but uh, hopefully it works now. But I see that even commission is taking care on me in reply. So, BT, thank you very much that you take a <laughs> note on me as well and care on me. I think the big picture, if you if you ask me about the socio-economic context, is of course the following: we have an unprecedented health and economic crisis, which we will take a while to recover for, uh, from. So there is the immediate challenge of supporting the economic recovery. That is uh, number one, which should be uh, the headline for all activities, not only on European level. At the same time, <clears throat> the European Union has defined very ambitious policy goals, for example, in the area of digitalization and moving towards a less carbon intensive economic model. So achieving those um, policy objectives will, of course, require substantial investments. And everyone knows insurance companies are arguably perfect long-term investors, and they have a long-term time horizon and predictable cash flow needs. So in that sense, the Solvency II review can be a chance. If we do it right, we can make life a little easier for the insurance industry and, at the same time, free up hundreds of billions of euros to support <clears throat> the European Union's policy ob objectives, the so-called win-win situation. But the important consideration is that we have to get it right and must not waste this opportunity. If I look at some of the AOPA proposals, which are extremely conservatively calibrated and would rather restrain than empower insurance com companies, and we spoke already about that, I'm not convinced that everyone has received the message. I'm particularly concerned about AUPA's proposal in relation to long-term guarantees and the extrapolation methods. I'm an engineer and I know with extrapolation you can do almost everything. And uh, therefore you should be very much aware that you can kill even the healthiest insurance company if you calibrate those measures too harshly. So. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, DTA takes a pencil and to rephrase some things which have been proposed by EUPA to translate it in a more easy language. In the end, I think we need to strike a sensible balance between an approach that is sufficiently prudent and an approach that lets insurers do what we want them to do. In my opinion, EUPA has not found this right trade-off on this the right balance. And the Commission would be well advised, as I said, to revisit this question as a matter of priority. Thank you very much, and sorry for the problems in the beginning. Thank you, and uh, I can only sympathize. I had a few problems myself. <laughs> so, um, But we've, we've covered now the, the, uh, some of the big issues around investment and long-term uh, long products. Uh, another key theme of the review is about the um, re operational complexity and, and, and burden of Solvency II and whether that can be addressed in some way. Um, so maybe if I could start with you, uh, Marcus Ferber, um, proportionality is a key principle of the EU rulemaking in general. And in the past, I know you've defended this principle in the regulation of other financial services sectors. What are your views on how the Solvency II review could be used to improve proportionality in Solvency II and, and so re reduce, uh, potentially reduce operational complexity and burden um, where it's not necessary. Yeah, thank you very much, Olaf, for this question, as I think that is one of the key elements which we have invented in the banking sector now in the last review of the CRD, the Credit Requirements Directive, where a small proposal from the Commission with a small banking box was really uh, done by the Parliament, and I was one of the key players there, uh, to a workable uh, proportionality approach, which now has to uh, brought to life, and we will work on that for the banking area. But we should introduce it for the insur insurance sector as well. This uh, old approach, ten years more than 10 years ago, one uh, rule fits all, will not function on European level. And therefore, um, the insurance regulation needs a healthy dose of proportionality. Um, the one-size-fits-all approach is usually very convenient for the supervisory authority. 
but it's not for the supervised entities, particularly for the smaller ones. I know that the insurance sector does not like being compared to the banking world, uh, but we have some experience, as I stated, on CRD5, CR2, and it can serve as a blueprint for the insurance sector. In banking regulation, we have agreed on a set of criteria that allows us to define what a small, it's not me to be very clear, so please the others are me. In the banking regulation, we have agreed on a set of criteria that allows us to define what a small and non-interconnected bank looks like. Basically, this is a way to define a non-risky bank. If you are a non-risky bank, you can turn a benefit from a lighter regulatory regime, for example, when it comes to reporting and disclosure, and that is one of the cost drivers. I believe this could be a sensible area to explore for insurance regulation as well. It should be possible to define certain quantity and perhaps qualitative thresholds that would allow us to de if differentiate between a boring insurance company that simply does, st uh, uh, does standard insurance businesses and the potential financial stability risk. The level and intensity of the provision should then be, of course, adopted accordingly. And I hope that the Commission is introducing something like that. I know it's a little bit difficult, more difficult in the insurance world than in the banking world. But even in the banking world, at the beginning, everyone told me that will not work, and now it works. So we have to move from Parliament's side to introduce proportionality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there, there was some background noise there, so I don't know if, uh, if others have to go on, on mute uh, and remember to take it off mute when you speak. Um, but I will now pass over to Didier. Um, uh, and uh, the Didier, the insurance industry has welcomed the Commission identifying proportionality as a key objective for the review um, and has launched uh, a, a number of work streams to address uh, the inefficiencies and overlaps. How far is the Commission open to go for a meaningful application of proportionality and a meaningful uh, improvement on the reporting requirements? Well, I think you're, you're right to say that we have identified this uh, as an objective since the beginning, and I think Sean was uh, pretty clear about it. Um, I hope by itself, I think, has worked hard on it and has really evolved in terms of the way it approaches the issue. Huh? Um, we have, as we know, the proportionality principle embedded in Solvency 2, but let's be very frank, the feedback which we receive uh, is very clearly saying that um, in reality, this principle is not implemented as well as it should. So we need to do something to to make it work better. And I think that what AOPA has proposed with the introduction of this new low risk undertaking category goes pretty much in the direction which Marcus Ferber has just highlighted that, about what was uh, done in the banking sector. So it, it's probably the right thing to do, um, of course, there will be discussion about the thresholds, how you define the criteria, how you define them. Um, and I know that the industry has um, uh, has made some points about this. We're going to look in, into those issues. But I think that the architecture of what IOPAS proposes is, is, is right and, and sets the, uh, the right direction. Uh, let's not forget as well the issue of the uh, renewal of the thresholds uh, below which uh, um, companies would not be subject to Solvency 2. Uh, we will also need to look at that. Uh, so a com combination of, of the two, in, in my view, is uh, is uh, a promising a promising um, path. Of course, uh, it's important to define what a, a low risk undertaking is, but also you need to attach to that definition uh, actual uh, relief measures and simplification measures. And this is also something which we will need to to look at very carefully. Uh, AOPA has made some proposals to, um, uh, for instance, uh, simplify some calculations, limit reporting requirements, and so on. Uh, this is something which we will need to look at as well. I mean, have they gone uh, far enough or not? Uh, I think that this is going to be something which uh, is going to keep us busy uh, as well in the next um, 
um, in, in the next month. But overall, I, I, my, my impression is that the direction of travel is, is, is the right one. Thank you. Thank you, Didier. Now, turning to, to the industry and, and maybe Allegra, you can um, give us some uh, in, insight into, into purport, how to get proportionality working from, from you, your point of view. I know that the Dutch market has, has done a lot of work on this along with some other members uh, and of course insurance Europe, but how uh, important is proportionality and how will EOPA's proposals, to what degree will EOPA's proposals uh, make proportionality work in practice? So thank you, Olaf, for, for the question. And indeed, the Dutch uh, do have a strong opinion on it. And thank you, Marcus and Didier, for, for putting forward some, uh, some uh, reassuring ideas. Um, yeah, so proportionality is a really important part of the review. It is important for insurers of all sizes, as mentioned by, by Marcus, and all business models, be them small companies, mutuals, captives, exchange traded, but also, actually, the large companies. And while it is vital, of course, for the smaller ones, obviously, for the large one, it's, it's really an important topic. Whenever and wherever Solvency II is not applied proportionately, it does create unnecessary cost and overcomplexification, which inevitably, inevitably uh, will impact customers in terms of costs and cumbersome processes. At the moment, proportionality is a key principle in Solvency II. But unfortunately, it is not working, and this has been acknowledged widely. So we welcome the attention uh, of the Commission that the Commission has placed on this, and that the OPA has made proposals which are good steps in the right direction. So will the OPA proposals make proportionality work in practice? Well, some of them will, in our view, and some of them will not. We think further improvements to EOPA's proposals are vital if proportionality is to really work in practice. So in particular, let me give you a couple of examples of what we really are looking for. First of all, is making it clear in the directive that not only can supervisors allow companies to avoid certain requirements in the text on the grounds of proportionality, but they actually have a duty to do so. The second example I can give you is that on EOPA's framework for automatic application of proportionality, we need, in our view, three refinements. One is to add some additional proportionality measures. The second one is to improve EOPA's definition of a low risk undertaking. And third is to extend automatic application of proportionality so that it can also apply to any companies if activities or risks are not material. So I hope with these ideas we can give a more pragmatic approach to proportionality so that we can go from theory to actually real application. Thank you. And finally then, Lionel, uh, what is your view around the, the need to get proportionality working in practice? Uh, and do you have any concerns or, or views on, on comments being made or concerns about excessive reporting requirements of Solvency II and whether that can be addressed? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, we uh, have to admit that uh, Solvency II is a rather complex model, uh, and let's be uh, that is creating even uh, some uh, black box effects. Uh, but let's be realistic. Uh, I think we cannot change that uh, without going completely backward. It's embedded in the uh, risk-based holistic approach of the model. So uh, uh, generally, this is uh, we have to we have to live with it. But at the same time, it raises at least two issues. Uh, one is uh, simplification, uh, which means that uh, every time uh, and at the time we are doing the review. Uh, for each module, for each policy, we should ask ourselves if uh, such complexity uh, at some point for this, uh, this or that uh, measure is uh, necessary or not. And we should simplify what can be simplified. And we should think twice or even 10 times before uh, introducing new complexity. Uh, in the model, and for instance, in the APAS advice, there are some uh, uh, some proposals that would introduce uh, uh, an important part of additional complexity. Uh, this should be really, really uh, weighed uh, in order to uh, to determine whether it's necessary or not. At the end of the day, it's it's the model, and the model is always a, a simplification. So uh, everything should be uh, should be balanced. Uh, 
The other topic is proportionality, definitely, um, because uh, it's burdensome for everyone, but it's even more burdensome, of course, for uh, smaller entities. And uh, the issue, uh, I fully agree with uh, uh, what uh, what you just said, that uh, it's very important to make proportionality work in practice. And our assessment at uh, the French market is uh, exactly the same at the European level that uh, Didier Munro stated a few uh, minutes ago. Uh, this, there, there is a lot of complaint in the, in the, the capability to really uh, make proportionality a reality uh, on the ground. Uh, even though uh, proportionality uh, is is uh, embedded in the model, it's uh, it's really uh, uh, something which is uh, which we really uh, introduced from the very beginning. But uh, the, the question is what we can do in practice, and we see actually uh, two main barriers uh, to the full use of the proportionality principle. And uh, we are seeing with lots of interest uh, the proposals of IOPAS in, in this regard. Uh, the first thing is. Um, uh, we can really uh, introduce more um, uh, automaticity in the use of proportionality uh, in order to make it more usable, in fact, for uh, the local supervisors. And uh, for instance, we welcome uh, really AOPAS proposing uh, uh, harmonized, seven harmonized criteria to uh, for the use of proportionality. Uh, definitely, we should also use uh, consider, sorry, um, the introduction of threshold uh, generally for automatic use of proportionality. This is, we, we know this is a way that uh, allows it to, uh, to work and to, uh, to be a reality on the ground. And the second um, important issue for us uh, is regarding uh, the calculation of SCR. Uh, in fact, with generally what is the case, uh, to use proportionality, you have to uh, prove that uh, you have to make the demonstration that the risk module is not material. So, in fact, the insurers are uh, asked for by the supervisor to fully calculate the risk module in order to prove that it's not necessary. And of course, when you have developed the, the, all the tools to calculate the risk module, there is no really real point in not calculating it. So, uh, just this fact is, is, a, is a real barrier, barrier to, um, to implementation of proportionality. Regarding your question uh, about uh, reporting, yes, definitely we should uh, work on reporting, uh, especially with uh, also with the supervisor. Uh, we we have identified, for instance, the question of the uh, the fourth quarter uh, reporting, which definitely uh, for us, for our supervisor, uh, for the companies, uh, could be abandoned on a proportionate basis at least, or even for other entities regarding the the quality of this reporting and the fact that we have uh, one month after. Uh, the annual reporting. Uh, and from a more global point of view, um, I would really like to underline that uh, we should, our priority should be to enhance the uh, proportional application of the framework, proportionality inside the model, rather than excluding uh, undertakings from Solvency 2. Uh, this is definitely not satisfactory uh, on, on any point of view. It's, it's uh, the, uh, the demonstration of a kind of failure in introducing proportionality if the only uh, solution is to exclude companies from uh, the, the, the framework. Uh, there are already uh, increased thresholds that are included in, uh, uh, in AOPA's advice. Maybe we should, uh, uh, we should go for this increase, but we may not uh, go further uh, regarding the, 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 the impact that it has on, uh, on the market, the consequences that may be unintended regarding policyholders' protection. Uh, if we create solvency two is to have it uh, applied. And uh, we don't want to create a, a, a two-speed uh, market. Uh, this, this, we should introduce proportionality, but not divide our market in uh, uh, the well, fully, normally capitalized, protected one with solvency two and, and the other one uh, with a model which is, in fact, uh, not really updated and uh, rules that are that are not uh, that are not designed uh, for that, in fact. So, uh, and especially uh, for for one topic that we will discuss later, which is uh, cross border cases. So, so more proportionality, more maybe automaticity, but uh, we're not really in favor of increasing thresholds. Okay, 
Thank you. I think there's uh, certainly a, a lot of focus on, on, on this issue, and I think that's uh, welcomed by all. Um, moving on to another area that the review is looking at, and that's the issue of uh, systemic risk and macro uh, prudential measures. Um, maybe I will start by asking Albon and Allegra, um, your companies, Aegon and AXA, have participated in the lengthy discussions on the international front on, on systemic risk. Do uh, you think that um, significant additional tools are needed uh, in Solvency 2 to address uh, systemic risk and macro prudential issues? Maybe Allegra. Yeah, so, so thank you, Olaf. Well, look, first of all, insurers are not systemic. The market is too parcelized, the liability is too illiquid and too national. So we're really not, not, not systemic. That being said, preemptive recovery plans, liquidity risk management plans, and supervisory powers to prevent mass lapses and to prepare for potential resolutions can be useful. There's no debate there. So these are the areas the Commission asked advice from the OPA and are also the areas included in the recent international holistic framework. But all remaining proposals, notably the intervention points before the SER, any additional systemic risk capital charge new concentration limits and dividend restrictions are not only not needed, but would actually also be counterproductive and could undermine the appeal for shareholders, which are the real last recourse source of capital in case of need. And so, and it would also undermine international competitiveness for European-based insurer, insurance companies versus other ones. So we would really, really advise against that. Thank you. Albon, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Olaf. One or two things to add. I obviously agree with uh, what Alec has just said. I think whatever is decided on, on this um, should be done with two principles in, in mind. The first one, obviously, is, is proportionality. And as uh, Lionel said uh, a minute ago, proportionality is essential, and notably for, for those because if I obviously agree with what Alec has said on the fact that we're not systemic, but if at the end of the day, something that we are, uh, the, 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 the smaller insurers uh, should see a, uh, a lower and a lighter burden than the larger, the larger ones. The second principle is that we should not gold plate uh, whatever was agreed international, internationally. Uh, there is no reason why European insurers should be penalized versus their competitors uh, in, uh, in the US or in Asia. Now, if, if I pick uh, two or three items in uh, the proposals of, um, of the EOPA, the, um, the first one is uh, the potential new intervention powers for supervisors before the SCI is breached. Uh, I think we have forgotten that already in Solvency 2, you have two intervention levels, the SCR, which is very demanding, and the MCR, the minimum capital requirement. So there is all the bandwidth necessary for supervisors to start intervention when the SCR is breached and before the MCR is breached. So um, why invent, why create a new intervention level which will simply increase capital requirements, and as we said during this discussion, make the industry less competitive and less able to provide the right products and invest in the long-term assets. So that's, that's very important. The second one is on capital surcharges for systemic risks. Again, we're not systemic, and that would further increase capital requirements. We don't need this. We just uh, lived the crisis last year we saw that the insurance industry was extremely resilient in Europe. So why do we want to add new capital requirements when there was no evidence that it was necessary? And the third one, it's um, on the proposals for new powers for, to control dividends. On this, uh, I think we need to be extremely careful because um, whatever is done to say that we need powers separate from what is in Solvency 2 undermines the credibility of Solvency 2. I mean, Solvency 2 with 
the calculation of your solvency ratio with the author get, that gives to the board all the information necessary on solvency, on risks, with a three to five year horizon, gives to the board all necessary data, all necessary uh, information in order to make a proper decision uh, in a prudent one. If we say that on top of that, supervisors need additional powers, even if the level of solvency is good, even if the boards, having made a prudent decision, have decided to pay a dividend, it fundamentally undermines the credibility of the framework. And I think that's uh, clearly not uh, the right direction. Thank you. Marcus, uh, what is your view on the global competitiveness of the European insurance industry? Um, do you see concerns about gold plating of international rules as, as something that could be uh, an issue of concern? Yeah, thank you very much. Setting international rules is, of course, a way to level the playing field, precisely to make sure that the success or lack of success of a company is determined by the quality of its business model, its innovation power, and its ability to make, make clients happy, and not by regulatory arbitrage possibilities. Having said that, if we now start gold plating these rules, we essentially do away with the benefits of a level playing field. On the contrary, we deliberately tilt the playing field again, but in a way that does not serve us, but other players, probably outside the European Union. If I look at it like that, I think it becomes quite evident that gold plating of international rules is usually not a very good idea. If we implement international standards, we need to be doing in a smart way be diligent enough so that no one can blame us for a lack of compliance, but be flexible enough to adapt international rules to the specific European features, then I think we are on the right track. So if we want to go beyond international rules, there needs to be a very, very, very convincing justification that overweights these concerns I have raised. Right now, to be very honest, I do not see such a justification. So my conclusion is we should avoid gold plating of international standards and international rules. We should transpose them one-to-one, -one, no doubt about that. And we should take care that it's implemented in all member states properly, that it is oversight properly by national competent authorities, but not more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, moving over to, to Lionel, um, given that France today is the market with the most internationally active insurance groups uh, in Europe, how do you see the issue of uh, systemic risk and, and, and macro prudential measures and, and the possible transposing of global standards into European law? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I really do share uh, the preoccupation that Mark has just expressed. Um, uh, we, we are less convinced than uh, Allegra and uh, Alban that there is no system in, in insurance, but uh, these discussions and, and the, the, the response should be at the right level, and the right level is definitely international. Um, it's very important uh, to, uh, to talk about the comparison between European market and the rest of the world. Uh, as underlined by uh, our minister, Bruno Le Maire, in his recent letter to the Commission, the competitiveness of the European insurance sector is key. And uh, in this uh, regard, this is very, uh, very important to stress the need for balanced review of solvency to capital requirements wise uh, generally. So to be more specific about uh, your question and, and uh, macro prudential, um, this is true. Uh, France uh, represents an important part of the internationally active insurance groups uh, in the European Union, even half of them. Um, at least the one concerned by uh, the uh, macro potential uh, rules or the discussions in the IIS, the Organization of Supervisors. And this is why we have a special responsibility uh, at the French market and the French regulator to, uh, to all these discussions. And, uh, uh, first of all, regarding the 
all international standards or so-called international standards. For instance, we should be very careful not to engage in projects such as uh, the ICS, International Capital Standard, designed by the IAS, which would not lead to any convergence at the global le level due to the concessions of the Abu Dhabi Agreement, uh, because our American friends uh, will not apply the, these, and they're just seeking uh, the equivalence uh, with uh, Solvency II. And uh, without uh, having a model which is risk-based, uh, like Solvency II, and uh, also as capital-intensive as Solvency II. So at least we should preserve our competitiveness asset, which is a risk-based uh, uh, model, and the fact it is recognized as such and not other, other models. Uh, on the review itself, um, we note that uh, AOPA is proposing to develop uh, a very ambitious macroprudential framework for insurance. Um, first of all, I would recall that AOPA proposal goes far beyond uh, what the, uh, the Commission asked, and it's also far beyond uh, what is discussed and what has been designed at AIS level, uh, which is called the holistic framework. For instance, uh, the capital surcharge for uh, systemic risk, which name uh, in all this international discussion was uh, HLA, the higher loss absorbency. Uh, it was abandoned years ago by the IAS. As the same can be said about lots of proposals, namely uh, uh, all the ones that will increase um, capital requirements, such as the introduction of a liquidity buffer or the ESRB uh, proposal regarding a counter-cyclical uh, capital buffer, which we will also oppose. So definitely we should not gold play because this is def exactly what it is, uh, international standards. Uh, all the more uh, when lots of jurisdictions uh, do not intend to apply these standards at all. And they'll be very clear uh, about that. So it will only result in uh, less competitiveness uh, for European markets, uh, more constraining uh, for our undertakings without any real benefit if it's not something which is really international and applies on the, on the, um, on the same kind of rules uh, all over the world, even though there are adaptations and welcome adaptations uh, on the different market. So even if we support at international level uh, the development of the holistic framework uh, uh, at a global level, we should not by ourselves as Europeans, go beyond that and go beyond what is necessary. So in this regard, definitely uh, the, the, the right balance was uh, the close list of items of the Commission, as we should definitely stick to it, uh, to our mind uh, in this review. Thank you. And then finally on, on this uh, topic, uh, Didier, um, Solvency 2 is generally recognized as being very comprehensive, uh, and we've heard from some of the panelists uh, some concerns about how far uh, EOPA's advice in this area goes. Uh, do you think there is a very big gap to fill on systemic risks uh, in Solvency 2, and, and how will you decide whether parts of EOPA's advice are really needed in Europe? Um, thank you, Olaf. Um, I think that as um, Lionel and other speakers said, we indeed entered in, uh, into this discussion uh, very prudently you know, with a, let's say a, a limited uh, number of topics which we asked uh, IOPA to, uh, to look at. But of course, this was before the, uh, the COVID uh, crisis uh, stroke. So I, I would tend to say that it's, it's a legitimate question to ask yourself at this stage with, with a type of economic situation in which we are, whether indeed um, we have all the tools at our disposals to, um, to deal with the potential issues uh, which insurers may create or be uh, confronted to. So I will not get into the discussion whether uh, insurers are systemic or not. I think this is probably beyond my, 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 uh, my knowledge, but um, I think, again, that this is a legitimate question. And we, uh, on the Commission side, we have also the responsibility to, to hear and listen to what um, the supervisory community is telling us, and uh, that includes IOPA, but also uh, the uh, European Systemic Risk Board. And they, they come with, a, indeed, um, a list of wishes to uh, complement the supervisory toolkits, that's the way they present it, with uh, additional instruments and tools, 
uh, which would not be automatically used, but be at the disposal of the supervisors in case of need. This is basically what, what they have in mind. Now, what does the Commission think about it? Again, these are two early days, but uh, let me nevertheless say a few words about that. Um, clearly, in our view, uh, the first layer of protection against any uh, systemic risk for insurers is the quality of the of the prudential framework. And as we I think, have discussed so far, uh, we are quite uh, reassured about that. And we are quite reassured about the way the insurers are fair through the, uh, the COVID crisis. So that is something which we need to take into consideration in, in, in this discussion, including the level of, uh, let's say, the uh, solvency and capital, um, capital requirements, which are already imposed on insurers. And we cannot, uh, have a discussion on systemic risk uh, by making abstraction of of, of that um, uh, first uh, first dimension. Um, we will look at the different proposals, and I would say look at them according to their to their needs and merits. Um, this is not necessarily going to lead to um, to us endorsing everything. Um, so we are looking at different uh, possibilities there. Um, but indeed, uh, uh, I agree with those who said that that discussion um, cannot be um, uh, held in isolation uh, to all the rest. And uh, we also need to integrate that dimension in our thinking about um, the, the role of the insurers in the, in the recovery and the, uh, the, um, let's say the solidity, uh, the existing, the current solidity and, and robustness of the uh, of the industry. So this will, uh, in my view, definitely be part of the uh, balancing exercise which the Commission will have to make uh, when designing its uh, its proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Didier. Um, and, and I will pass over you to again as we move on to the next section, but I, I think your, your screen is off, but I think that may be to ensure your sound quality, but otherwise maybe you, you may want to turn that back on. Um, but moving on to the other areas of the review, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. okay. the um, the review is 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 a very wide one, and the EOPA's uh, proposals go far beyond the topics we've discussed so far, which I think many people see as, as maybe the key areas of, of of discussion. However, there are quite a few other areas, and I think in this last sort of uh, part of the panel uh, questions. Uh, we'd like to give you a chance to discuss some of the others, and that includes the, the IGS harmonization, cross-border cooperation, group supervision, uh, etc. Now, Didier, what are your preliminary views on the extensive proposals from the OPRA on those, on those issues? Um, can the scope of the review be narrowed, um, and maybe in order to, 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 to ensure a faster process, or it, are significant legislative changes needed across all these areas? Um, thanks. Uh, uh, um, let, let me start like this. I mean, um, policyholder protection is, is is central, as we know, to um, to solvency too. So we, we I think we have a, a good occasion to to see if um, we have all the the tools and mechanisms at our disposal to make sure that this is actually uh, the case. Uh, and in that context, supervision plays a key role. So we, uh, I think. Uh, usually can have a look at the way supervision works um, in the single market at this stage. And this is, I think, what Ayoba has done. And uh, Ayoba has come with a, a lot of work in, in this issue and, and in, with interesting proposals which we need to uh, to look at. So um, the, the, the quality of the supervision of cross-border activity is something uh, which is important to us. Um, there have been some events uh, where insurers have failed and created some uh, damages for people who were uh, depending or relying on those insurers. And this uh, has shed some light to the fact that in those cases, the cooperation between the supervisors could have been better. And IOPA could also have played a, a better role in, in, let's say, coordinating that, uh, that supervision exercise and ensuring, let's say, a, as high a level of protection as possible. So um, this is something which we, I think we need to look at, and that should be part of Solvency 2. 
AOPA comes with, I would say, targeted uh, proposals to improve the flow information, the coordination role of AOPA. We think that there is a lot of merit to look into those. We also know that member states sometimes would go a bit further than that, uh, including in terms of the type of information that could be shared between uh, uh, home and host supervisors. Um, I think there is also merit in looking at those issues. Um, we are not looking at a, a revolution here. This is not about going to centralize supervision or whatever. I mean, we, we know that these are difficult issues that we have to take a step-by-step -step approach. But there is, again, uh, in our view, merit in, in, in trying to, to strengthen a bit the system and, and put a bit of oil in the, um, in the mechanism. Uh, now, there's also the issue of group supervision. It's a very complex one, but also important. That also, um, by definition, implies a lot of cooperation between supervisors. And it's clear that the rules there are not always very clear, and the way they are implemented is also not very, very clear. So IOPA has worked very hard with the experts to come with proposals, which we believe also have some uh, so, some merit, uh, but again, they are very complex, but overall, they seem to go in the direction of, um, of simplification and better application. Uh, we know that sometimes um, they may lead to, um, let's say, um, they may have some impact for some, some of the urban groups, which we need to, to, to look at uh, specifically, and we are in contact with those groups to make sure that at least we have a, a, a good understanding of the impact. Uh, but the issue of group supervision, we believe, is also something which uh, would have, uh, we would see merit in, 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 in tackling as part of the review. Now, last word, uh, not least on IGS. This is the ultimate way of uh, protecting policyholders in case uh, of failure of an insurer. Um, it's been discussed for, for many years, and there too, IOPA and the supervisory committee, community has made a a lot of progress in trying to find a common ground for ensuring a, as a, let's say an equal level of protection as possible uh, within the single market. So uh, we see merit there too in, in examining that dimension. Uh, but of course, we are fully aware that this is not an easy uh, this is not an easy uh, uh, let's say undertaking, and this will also come with uh, impact and cost for the industry. So this will also let's say need to be uh, to be uh, including into of our overall thinking about the um, uh, about the review so I, I stop here for the sake of time thank you yeah thank you um allegra do you does the do you say the industry sees a need for changes in these areas yeah thank you so i'm afraid we have slightly more staunchly opposed views on some of these items versus versus the da and and hopefully some of the arguments we can put forward can uh, can um, help in some of the debates so on the first point which is cross-border supervision we do agree with the opas proposals because we really need to make sure that sovereignty two is applied correctly across europe so i think there we we definitely agree also with, with the da so yes to strengthening and enhancing cooperation between home and host authorities yes to improving coherence and convergence in the supervision of activities based on freedom of services, freedom of establishment, protection of consumers. So that part, we all agree. The second one, we start disagreeing. So on groups, EOPA has gone, in our view, too far, because there's maybe only one point with a proven and clear need for fixing. For all the rest, there are already sufficient supervisory convergence tools, and it is important to avoid additional complexity, costs, and capital charges in order to preserve, uh, to preserve the European industry competitive competitiveness globally, but also to preserve the flexibility and supervisory dialogue to ensure national supervisory authorities can adapt to the various group structures and risk profile. Let's not forget that some of the structures in insurance and some of the services provided by insurers are deeply linked to the social security and retirement systems of every country. So it's really important not to go too far there. And then on IGS, well, I guess that's where we really have a, a very different view. So our view is that harmonizing and introducing mandatory IGS would be really, really, really complicated. But actually, even more than that, it would create moral hazard because actually customers may no longer pay attention 
to the fundamental strengths of the company they are dealing with or about to deal with. And I, th and I think that in recent history, and I realized this was not an insurance company because thank God you, we still don't have any IGS in insurance. But we've seen with Rental Bank that this whole concept of guaranteed fund has actually played a role in the demise of the whole situation. So we want to make sure that we don't create that moral hazard, that we don't create yet more new capital buffers, which will inevitably, inevitably again end up as a hidden tax on customers. So if an IGS were planned to be part of the framework from the start, then actually Solvency II would have been designed and calibrated in a very different way. Let's remember that in the industries where an IGS does exist, like in banking, the capital framework is not an economic framework and is not calibrated in the same way as Solvency II. There's no concept of one in 200. Within Solvency II, we have that concept of one in 200, which de facto, de facto assumes implicitly the existence of a very high standard and therefore any IGS would come over and above that standard and frankly that is just too much. So in other jurisdiction where an IGS is mandatory we see lower capital requirements and a higher tolerance for insurers failing and thereby then invoking the IGS. So our point is if you really want an IGS then you've got to reduce the standard that you apply to solvency too, it cannot be a one in 200 anymore because otherwise you're, you're just creating an impossible burden, which in the end will have to be borne by consumers because they are the ones taking this, these products because they need it from a societal point of view. So the focus in our view should be on ensuring that solvency too is well calibrated and applied appropriately across jurisdictions and on cooperation and coordination between supervisory authorities and resolution authorities, not in creating yet another automatic buffer of some version. Thank you. Uh, over to, to you, Marcus. Do you have any views in these areas? And, and uh, to the remaining to the panelists, I'm afraid we, we'll have to be quite quick now because uh, we, uh, we are moving close to our, our end point. So uh, if you can be uh, quite quick with your answers, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Olaf. I have, of course, some views on those areas, and I will be very shortly uh, and only address them, but we have to solve them during the negotiations after the Commission has presented its proposals. Number one, I think in the area of investor protection through insurance guarantee funds, there's room for a little more harmonization than we currently have. Particularly in some Eastern European countries, there is very little protection for clients against a worst case scenario. Insurance guarantees funds are either not there, completely underfunded, or written with bureaucracy designed to prevent policyholders from receiving the payout. And in average, every three months, I have a constituent uh, who moved from Eastern Europe to my constituency with those problems. and. Normally, I can't help because of these problems, so we have to address that. In some other markets, supervisory authorities seem either not willing or not capable to set up pragmatic guarantee systems themselves, so we have to have a look on that as well. And in an integrated European insurance markets, of course, there's a case for a minimum level of harmonization. I'm not talking about the risk mutualization at the moment with banking union, but of a set of rules that establishes a minimum baseline for the protection of policyholders in the worst case scenario. And that would be my number one to be solved during the legislative process. I hope I was short enough now. Yeah, thank you. Um, Alina, do you have views on other areas that uh... Uh, such as those we've just uh, been discussing. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we have strong views, in fact, uh, on these topics. And uh, uh, we really do not think that it is a second uh, grade uh, issue. This is definitely, uh, and this will be a priority for us in this review. 
this is a question of the cross-border activity and uh, the quality of supervision throughout uh, the European Union uh, is a key issue uh, for uh, competition, uh, for level playing field, but also for consumer protection. And uh, this is really uh, the, the, the single market which is at stake. And if we don't solve these issues, we're really uh, undermining and endangering uh, the, the single market because uh, we cannot go on the difficulties that we experienced uh, in the past few years and we are still experiencing today. We experienced multiple collapses, cross-border businesses uh, in France, in many countries, in fact, uh, over the years. And these, these difficulties, we are still struggling with them uh, currently because we still have some schemes. And, uh, and most of the time, it was on long-term guarantees and the consequences of the collapse of an insurance undertaking when we are dealing with long-term uh, uh, guarantees, uh, it takes time. Uh, and, and these difficulties we will be experiencing in the next few years, in fact. So we definitely cannot be satisfied with the situation. Uh, we made some progress with ESAS reviews last year uh, with the creation of the... Uh, uh, the cooperation platform uh, between the supervisors with the um, the um, the excellent uh, notification uh, before uh, going on uh, uh, cross-border activities but we should definitely uh, go further and take the opportunity of this uh, review to do that uh, we issued a contribution to the uh, review with our dutch colleagues and our italian colleagues uh, in which we stressed the need to enhance uh, the European framework in three objectives. Uh, one is to foster uh, supervisory convergence and improve discipline uh, on market players, uh, improve information sharing and collaboration between the home and host uh, authorities, and third, uh, harmonize the recovery and resolution frameworks throughout the union. Uh, well, harmonize would mean uh, create something in most countries because we have a framework in, uh, in the Netherlands, we have a framework in France, we have a framework in Romania, but this is pretty old. And, uh, and the issue is to, uh, to develop at least some, some rules uh, in order to have these schemes work and they really work if they are uh, at European level and not uh, uh, at the national level. So in this regard, we really welcome uh, the AEPAS advice, uh, which deals with these topics. We could even add some proposals, uh, such as the possibility to use Article 19 of the AEPAS regulation uh, in the context of collaboration platforms in order to make them even more effective, uh, or to provide for an exchange of prudential information between home and host supervisors and so on. So uh, really supportive, and we should we can even go further. Uh, we also support, uh, to go back on, on, on the last point of uh, Irene, uh, the, what is proposed regarding the harmonization of the functioning of insurance guarantee schemes uh, throughout European Union. Uh, what we experienced, for instance, in France is that uh, at the end of the day, uh, they, there is no moral hazard regarding uh, insurance policy order because they are not covered by any uh, guarantee fund. Uh, the, the, the host one was not working for that, uh, the home one were not working for that, and at the end of the day, we just have the problem. And, and if there is a moral hazard, in fact, is regarding uh, the supervisor. If we create, and, and this is what we are forced to develop, uh, only uh, guarantee schemes that are working on our markets, uh, even for uh, insurance companies that are supervised or not well supervised in other countries, uh, we create moral hazard. But if uh, we have rules in which the fact that this is the same country that is supervising and that is providing for financing if there is a collapse, we can solve this issue. Uh, but for that, we definitely we should talk about, uh, talk about some harmonization in order to have things work, because the current situation is definitely not satisfactory. So uh, this is a difficult topic on which we'd have, uh, we need to have lots of debates between, between us uh, in order to, um, to, make, to have something effective, to, to be able to trust each other. Uh, but this is definitely an issue, and we are welcoming uh, the proposals of the AOPAS in, in this direction. Thank you. Um, Albon, do you have any uh, any other points you'd like to raise? Yeah, just one, and I'll be quick given the uh, the time constraint. Uh, we haven't mentioned intern models; uh, they play a key part in um, in the framework, and um, I think it's important that we avoid new reporting requirements or, or restrictions. Uh, they are already subject to uh, extensive supervisory oversight approval processes. So I don't think we should. Uh, increase the burden because they are extremely useful to uh, properly model risks 
notably in large groups. Thank you. I think I do have one closing question for the panelists, but I think we have just enough time for maybe one um, audience question. Um, and I think that uh, I think that we. Um, so the question we have is is about the um, the. Uh, let me see which one. Um, we have a question about uh, the discussion about a balanced outcome, and um, some people have talked about a balanced outcome. But the question from the audience is: What what does that really mean in concrete terms? Uh, does it mean by member state? Does it mean by type of company, long or short term business, internal model, etc.? Um, so, judging by Yoka's proposal, they they take a, a very average view, and of course, the, in reality, uh, the world isn't isn't average. It's a it's a particular outcome. So. Um, maybe I can pass it on to uh, to BBA first for a quick, very quick response to that. Thank you. It, it's 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 not an easy question to be uh, uh, to to answer. Ideally, of course, we should try to balance at different levels, but of course, we. Uh, we are working collectively at European level, so we, we are, at the end of the day, we need to find some kind of a solution that is the, let's say, uh, the least harmful for everyone. Let's put it that way. So uh, we're going to, to produce our own impact assessment and try to, to be as granular as we can, but it's, it's not easy. Uh, but if we can already have a, a review that is balanced overall and, and, and mined indeed uh, for different uh, groups of perhaps uh, member states and types of business, well, I think we would have achieved a lot. But it's 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 not always an easy exercise to be uh, to be frank. But we we, we know that these are uh, the concerns are exist and we need to uh, we need to take them into account. Okay, I think because of the time, we don't have uh, time for other. Uh, Q and A's, unfortunately, but I do have a closing question to all to each of the panelists uh, before we we hear the closing remark from. Uh, uh, um, so, imagine you are looking back in five years' time and what the review has achieved. How would you define a successful review? So maybe starting with Albon, uh, and please do keep your answer short. Yeah. Okay, I'll be short. I'd say for me there are two criteria. One is, will insurers have participated strongly to the European recovery plan after the COVID crisis, to the green transition, and to the capital markets union? And the second criterion for me is, will we have a stable framework with no need to further adjust it? We've already adjusted it once. That's the second time. I don't think we should adjust it every other year. Thank you. Allegra? I agree with Albon, but I would add two things. One, artificial volatility. So it's a success if artificial volatility has been reduced so that solvency two doesn't create a, an artificial problem for insurers if we go into another financial crisis and volatility becomes more akin to what it was in the past. Second, um, it's a success if EU-based insurers can maintain and grow their position as world leading companies. This is a sector where Europe has been leading throughout history. This is not the moment to become a laggard. Thank you. Didier, could you give your views? Well, I think indeed, I don't, I don't, sorry, put it very, very well. Uh, although it's also it's, um, obviously very difficult to project ourselves in five years. I mean, I would wish that uh, um, between now and that uh, time, we would not have to go through uh, another another big crisis. But let, let, let's say, uh, yes, um, um, a stable Solvency II regime that continues to be, let's say, uh, the, uh, the reference also internationally uh, I think to also to the benefit of our European industry. 
um, a stable regime that uh, would make it, uh, let's say, easy for us to uh, be compliant with uh, any international uh, obligation as well. And also a stable regime that will uh, have helped, as Alban said, the industry to take their, their, their full share in the recovery and the, uh, and the greening of the economy that would be uh, indeed a, a great success. And you know. Uh, thank you. Uh, definitely for us, uh, it would be a success if we uh, managed to do a review driven by our goals of public policy. And uh, Alban stated some of them very well, uh, contributing to the recovery, contributing to uh, the Green Deal. I would add resilience. I would add competitiveness of, uh, of viewers. And so we should make our technical uh, choices according to our public policy uh, goals and not the reverse, uh, running for uh, of public policy goals after technical choices. Uh, so, which means keep working, keep what is working, tackle what is not. Uh, Solvency 2 could definitely contribute to uh, European competitiveness or it could weaken it. So now we are at the very beginning of the review. We should not miss this turn and uh, give the review all the ambition that it needs. Thank you. And uh, Marcus. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. For me, the two main challenges uh, as well, that we should focus on in the Solvency 2 review uh, proportionality and facilitating long-term investment. A successful Solvency 2 review should be measured against those two yardsticks. If in five years' time, we have a competitive European insurance sector that has a little more room to maneuver and can contribute meaningfully to blocking the investment gap in the European Union, I think then we have achieved a lot. Thanks. Thank you. And now we will uh, pass over for closing remarks from Irene Tignali, uh, MEP and Chair of the European Parliament's Econ Committee. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. And I'm sorry for you know not being able to be live uh, uh, with you for the debate, but I'm glad I have the opportunity to send this message. Um, the title of the of the event uh, is uh, particularly uh, ambitious, you know, and uh, and definitely indicates the challenges uh, that are related to one of the most important ties that we have. Uh, ahead of us, so where all institutions and stakeholders are engaged uh, for ensuring its success for the benefit of the European economy. Uh, let's start from you know, the macroeconomic and market scenario where this review is taking place. Uh, you know, we experienced a very deep recession. Uh, we are now on a path for the recovery, but uh, with the risk that remain very high, unfortunately, uh, string to linked to a, a high degree of uncertainty. Uh, this uncertainty, as you know, is uh, mainly related to the evolution of the pandemic or then the success of the vaccination uh, campaigns in the different uh, member states. And uh, uh, at the same time, though, um, we also expect uh, that the impact of next generation EU could fuel stronger growth than projected. Um, ESRB and the ESAs are actually warning on a potential effect of the decoupling uh, between financial market performance and economic outlook, and especially for the insurance sectors where uh, you know, there are risks of an increase in uh, lapses and surrenders, uh, reduction of profitability and shocks on asset prices. Uh, we still don't know exactly what the full picture would look like, uh, and should we, you know, we should be very careful for the tail effects uh, of this crisis, um, especially with respect to some sectors, uh, which may reveal their weaknesses once the public sector is is gone, and 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 this could have an impact on unemployment, uh, which in turn could have an impact on uh, the number of lapses and surrenders, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, under the current circumstances, I think the review should take into account two main uh, issues. On one hand, uh, the lessons learned from the crisis, um, even though, of course, the application of the rules will be 
um, you know, will be only in some years, but I think we can still, you know, learn lessons from what we've just been through. Um, and on the other hand, uh, being able to strengthen um, a regime that uh, looks at risk from a, a forward-looking perspective. Um, it, it was, after all, exactly this forward-looking perspective that is embedded in Solvency II that the European insurance companies managed to uh, uh, arrive to this uh, crisis well capitalized and, uh, and prepared, and that have been able to go through the crisis uh, on a pretty strong basis so far. Um, however, you know, as uh, recognized by everybody, there is some work that needs to be done uh, to reform some elements that didn't work properly uh, within solvency. Uh, and after all, the question of this event uh, is indeed to understand uh, how to make such reform a right one. Uh, so I believe we should focus on three main aspects. Uh, first of all, uh, capital markets union. Uh, second, proportionality, and third, uh, policyholder uh, protection. Uh, on the capital market union, um, it, it's been widely recognized that the review of Solvency II is basically part uh, of the action plan on the capital markets union. Um, indeed, a well-functioning and diversified capital markets that uh, you know, provide for a wider uh, source of financial, uh, financing options to European companies and citizens is the prerequisite to make it possible to achieve uh, a sound recovery from the pandemic, but also to address and achieve uh, the main challenges of our times, the green transition, uh, the digital transformation, and uh, you know, the creation of a more competitive, uh, inclusive, and resilient economy. Now, we are uh, facing impacts and consequences of the pandemic, and this crisis made, it, made us realize how important uh, to create an administrative and a legal framework that is more conducive to uh, investments, especially the investments you know, that have a long-term uh, perspective and that are directed to support the real economy. And in this sense, uh, the insurance sector is key to achieving the objectives of the Capital Markets Union. Uh, as Europe's largest institutional investors, insurers have the financial strength to provide widespread benefits for the economy, acting in a counter-cyclical manner and investing with a sustainable longer-term perspective. In this regard, I think the area of capital requirements represents uh, an example, although not the only one, of course, um, EIOPA has already been working on this area and we are now looking forward to the uh, Commission work. Um, I'm looking with interest to this debate and uh, in particular on the treatment of long-term uh, investments, including in case of illiquid liabilities, as they are expected to be less vulnerable to short-term and fluctuations in market values. Um, a more favorable but still prudent uh, treatment uh, could really improve the risk sensitivity of the framework, facilitating uh, long-term guarantees uh, and uh, long-term productive uh, investments. Of course, this assessment should not be limited uh, to the calibration of uh, the capital charges on investments, uh, because under, you know, under the current uncertainty, um, insurers' ability to contribute to our political objectives uh, may depend more heavily on whether the prudential framework is efficient in mitigating the impact of short-term market volatility uh, on insurance solvency positions. So the review of so-called long-term guarantee measures should therefore play a pivotal role in our debate. Um, in particular, as lessons to learn from both crises, we should rather enhance uh, financial markets capacity to act uh, in a counter-cyclical uh, manner and investing with a longer-term perspective and therefore we should avoid uh, pro-cyclicality. Uh, you know, fixing flaws in solvency too and avoid artificial volatility uh, I think really is vital to unlock uh, long investment and to boost uh, the economic growth and recovery. On the second point, uh, on proportionality, um, the 2020 Solvency II should pursue, of course, among other things, but a, a reduction of undue requirements and constrictions that applies to all firms in the same way. 
Um, and when I refer to undue requirements and constrictions, I mean that uh, you know, we need uh, to, to take into consideration properly the principle of proportionality in the review process in a way that um, you know, um, we can subject smaller or less complex insurers to simplified requirements that achieve prudential objectives, uh, especially you know, policyholders' interest, uh, financial stability, but uh, without being unduly uh, burdensome uh, for them. Um, the third and last point, uh, policyholder protection. Mm, the Solvency II framework has done a lot uh, for, on, this, uh, on this front uh, by strengthening the insurance sector and making it more resilient. Uh, the single market uh, uh, helped the European market develop uh, in the interest of consumers who gain access to a much wider choice of products in all member states. And this freedom to provide services is a milestone uh, for the integration of the European Union and our efforts should be towards you know, increasing and strengthening uh, this uh, achievement. Mm, however, we, we, we still have to uh, you know, take note of the fact that um, the, European, the protection of European consumers is still very highly fragmented. Um, and the situation is particularly worrisome when it comes to cross-border aspects, uh, uh, where the uh, level of prudence uh, can be very different from one state uh, to another. Solvency II framework uh, has already partially improved um, the situation in the last SS review, uh, but I think it should be um, equipped uh, with new rules to give policyholders uh, a fair and equivalent position across uh, all the, the entire European Union. And in particular, I believe that we should enhance uh, uh, the European framework, uh, first of all, to foster supervisory convergence and improve uh, discipline on market players, and secondly, to improve information uh, sharing and collaboration between home and host um, authorities in the Union. Um, I believe that EOPA has already made some good steps uh, in this direction, um, notably regarding peer reviews, collaboration platforms, uh, but I think the new directive should um, even you know, strengthen uh, supervisory convergence, uh, information sharing and collaboration, which is uh, also in line uh, with uh, Parliament's demands uh, in the last SS review. Uh, let me just you know, conclude by thanking you again uh, for this invitation. Um, I believe this is a very good opportunity to address uh, different views and issues around this uh, you know, virtual uh, uh, table. It's clear to everybody that this review is uh, a very important challenge for all of us and uh, so we should ensure that we make it right. Uh, we have a lot of experience to leverage, we have experience from the past uh, crisis unfortunately, uh, we have experience from the implementation of the directive uh, so far, so we have lots of element to really make it right. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you very much uh, to Arin Tinali for those comments. Thank you to the panelists uh, for their contributions. And thank you, of course, to the attendees as well. We actually received a lot of technical questions and comments on the tech and technical elements, which show how important it is to carefully assess the proposals. And like I think uh, Lionel and Marcus mentioned, find the right balance between political objectives and the technical choices. Uh, thank you all for your participation. We now close the event.